Okay. <clears throat> the discourse tonight is the Chula Satrika Sutta, the shorter discourse to Satrika. It's number 35. Um, before we get started, Satrika was a person that was real good in debating, and he would go around to all of these different teachers that uh, were somewhat popular in India at the time, and he would argue with them, and he would try to get them to get unbalanced and angry and and that sort of thing. So he decided he was going to do that to the, the Buddha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thus have I heard on one occasion, the Blessed One was living in, at Visali in the great wood in the hall with the peaked roof. Now on that occasion, Sachika, the Nigantha's son, was staying at Visali. He was a debater and clever speaker, regarded by many as a saint. He was making his statement before the Visali assembly. I see no recluse or Brahmin, the head of an order, the head of a group, the teacher of a group, even one claiming to be a accomplished and fully awakened, who would not shake, shiver, and tremble, and sweat under the armpits if he were to engage in debate with me. Even if I were to engage a senseless post in debate, it would shake, shiver, and tremble <laughs> if it were to engage in debate with me. No, that's pride. <laughs> so what shall I say of a human being? Then when it was morning, the venerable Asaji, dressed and taking his bowl and outer robe, went into Visali for alms. As Sachika, the Nigantha's son, was walking and wandering for exercise in Visali, he saw the venerable Asaji coming in the distance and went up to him and exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, Sachika, the Nigantha's son, stood at one side and said to him, Master Asaji, how does the recluse Gotama discipline his disciples? And how is the recluse Gotama's instruction usually presented to his disciples? This is how the Blessed One disciplines his disciples, Asaji, or Satchika. And this is how the Blessed One instruction is usually presented to his disciples. Monks, Material form is impermanent. Feeling is impermanent. Perception is impermanent. Formations are impermanent. Consciousness is impermanent. Monk's material form is not self. Feeling is not self, or we could change that to impersonal. Perception is impersonal. Formations are impersonal. Consciousness is impersonal. All formations are impermanent. All things are impersonal. That is how the Blessed One disciplines his disciples. And that is how the Blessed One's instruction is usually presented to his disciples. If we have heard what the recluse Gotama asserts, we have indeed heard what is disagreeable. 
perhaps sometime or other we might meet Master Gotama and have some conversation with him. Perhaps we might detach him from that evil view. Now at that time, 500 Lekavis had met together in an assembly hall for some business or other. Then Sachika, the Nigantha son, went to them and said, Come forth, good Lekavis, come forth. Today there will be some conversation between me and the recluse Gotama. If the recluse Gotama maintains before me what he has maintained before one of his famous disciples, the monk named Asaji, then just as a strong man might seize a long-haired ram by the hair and drag him to and drag him fro and drag him round about, so in debate I will drag the recluse Gotama to and drag him fro and drag him round about. Just as a strong brewer's workman might throw a brewer's sieve into a deep water tank and take it by its corners, drag it to and drag it fro and drag it round about. So in debate I will drag the recluse Gotama to and drag him fro and drag him round about. Just as a strong brewer's mixer might take a strainer by the corners and shake it down and shake it up and thump it about. So in debate I will shake the recluse Gotama down and shake him up and thump him about. Yeah, you can see what's going to happen, right? <laughs> And just as a 60-year-old elephant might plunge into a deep pond and enjoy playing the game of hemp washing, so I shall enjoy playing the game of hemp washing with the recluse Gotama. Come forth, good Lekavis, come forth. Today there will be some conversation between me and the recluse Gotama. Thereupon, some Lekavis said, Who is the recluse Gotama that he could refute Sachika, the Nigantha's son's assertions? On the contrary, Sachika, the Nigantha's son, will refute the recluse Gotama's assertion. And some Lekavis said, who is Sachika, the Nigantha son, that he could f refute the, re the Blessed One's assertions? On the contrary, the Blessed One will refute Sachika, the Nigantha son's assertions. Then Sachika, the Nigantha son, went with 500 Lekavis to the hall with the peaked roof in the great wood. <clears throat> now on that occasion a number of monks were walking up and down in the open. Then Sachika, the Nigantha's son. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. Went up to them and asked, Where is Master Go Gotama staying now, sirs? We want to see Master Gotama. The Blessed One has entered the great wood, Sachika, and is sitting at the root of a tree for the day's abiding. Then Sachika, the Nigantha son, together with a large following of Lekavis, entered the great wood and went to the Blessed One. He exchanged greetings with the Blessed One. And after this courteous and amiable talk was finished, sat down at one side. 
Some of the Lekavis paid homage to the Blessed One and sat down at one side. That means they kneeled to him. Some exchanged greetings with him. And when this courteous and amiable talk was finished, sat down at one side. Some extended their hands in reverential salutation towards the Blessed One and sat down at one side. Some pronounced their name and clan in the Blessed One's presence and sat down at one side. Some kept silent and sat down at one side. When Satchika, the Nigantha son, had sat down, he said to the Blessed One, I would like to question Master Gotama on a certain point. If Master Gotama would grant me the favor of an answer to the question, ask what you like, Satchika. How does Master Gotama discipline his disciples? And how is Master Gotama's instruction usually presented to his disciples? This is how I discipline my disciples, Satchika. And this is how my instruction is usually presented to my disciples. Monk's material form is impermanent. Feeling is impermanent. Perception is impermanent. Formations are impermanent. Consciousness is impermanent. Monk's material form is impersonal. Feeling is impersonal. Perception is impersonal. Formations are impersonal. Consciousness is impersonal. All formations are impermanent. All things are impersonal. That is the way I discipline my disciples. And that is how my instruction is usually presented to my disciples. A simile occurs to me, Master Gotama. Explain how it occurs to you, Satchika, the Blessed One said. Just as when seeds and plants, whatever their kind, reach growth, increase, and maturation, all do so in dependence upon the earth, based upon the earth. And just as when strenuous work, whatever their kind, are done, all are done in dependence upon the earth based upon the earth. So too, Master Gotama. A person has material form as self. Based upon material form, he produces merit or demerit. A person has feeling as self, and based upon feeling, he produces merit or demerit. A person has perception as self and based upon perception he produces merit or demerit. A person has formations as self and based upon formation he produces merit or demerit. A person has consciousness as self and based upon consciousness he produces merit or demerit. So what he's really saying is the Brahman belief in reincarnation. Okay, and he's trying to hold that up and listen to what the Buddha does with this. Sachika, are you not asserting thus Material form is myself. Feeling is myself. Perception is myself. Formations are myself. Consciousness is myself. I assert thus, Master Gotama, material form is myself. 
Feeling is myself. Perception is myself. Formations are myself. Consciousness is myself. And so does this great multitude. And what has this great multitude multitude to do with you, Satchika? Please confine yourself to your own assertion alone. Then, Master Gotama, I assert thus, material form is self, feeling is myself, perception is myself, formations are myself, consciousness is myself. In that case, Satchika, I shall ask you a question in return. Answer it as you choose. What do you think? Would a head-anointed noble king, for example, King Pasanati of Kosala or King Ajatasattu of Magadha, exercise the power of his own realm to execute those who should be executed, to find those who should be fined, and to banish those who should be banished. Master Gotama, a head-anointed noble king, for example, King Pasanati of Kosala or King Ajatasattu of Magadha, would exercise the power in his own realm to exercise, uh, uh, to execute, excuse me, those who should be executed, to find those who should be fined, to banish those who should be banished. For even these oligarchic communities and societies, such as the Vajins, the Malians exercise the power in their own realm to execute those who should be executed, to find those who should be fined, and to banish those who should be banished. So all the more so should a head anointed noble king, such as King Pasanati of Kosala, or King Ajatasattu of Magadha, he would exercise it, Master Gotama. He would be worthy to exercise it. Now it starts to get interesting. What do you think, Satchika, when you say thus, material form is myself? Do you exercise any such power? over that material form as to say, let my form be thus, let my form not be thus. When this was said, Sachika, the Nigantha son, was silent. Mm. A second time the Blessed One asked the same question, and a second time Sachika, the Nigantha son, was silent. When the blessed, then the blessed one said to him, Satchika, now, uh, answer now. Now is not the time to be silent. If anybody, when asked a reasonable question up to the third time by the Tathagata, still does not answer, his head splits into seven pieces there and then. <laughs> So maybe it's a good idea to answer it. <laughs> now on that occasion, a thunderbolt wielding spirit holding an iron thunderbolt that burned and blazed and glowed appeared in the air above Sachika, the Nigantha's son. Thinking if Sachika, the Nigantha's son, when asked a reasonable question up to the third time by the Blessed One, still does not answer, I shall split his head into seven pieces here and now. 
The Blessed One saw the thunderbolt-wielding spirit, and so did Satrika, the Niganta's son, but nobody else saw it. Then Satrika, the Niganta's son, was frightened, alarmed, and terrified, seeking his refuge, asylum, and refuge, uh, seeking his shelter, asylum and refuge in the Blessed One himself. He said, ask me, Master Gotama, I will answer. Whew. That was a close one. What do you think, Satchika, when you say thus, material form is myself, do you exercise any such power over that material form as to say, let my form be thus, let my form not be thus. No, Master Gotama. Pay attention, Satchika, pay attention to how you reply. What you said afterwards does not agree with what you said before. Nor does what you said before agree with what you said afterwards. What do you think, Satchika, when you say thus, feeling is myself? Do you exercise any such power over that feeling as to say, let my feeling be thus, let my feeling not be thus? That's what you try to do with some pains that come up, isn't it? <laughs> no, Master Gotama. Pay attention, Satchika. Pay attention to how you reply. What you said afterwards does not agree with what you said before, nor does what you said before agree with what you said afterwards. What do you think, Satchika, when you say perception is myself? Do you exercise any power over that perception as to say, let my perception be thus, let my perception not be thus? And that's what happens when you have some hindrances come up. No, Master Gotama. Pay attention, Satchika. Pay attention to how you reply. What you said afterwards does not agree with what you said before, nor does what you said before agree with what you said afterwards. What do you think, Satchika, when you say thus? Formations are myself. Do you exercise any such power over these formations as to say, let my formations be thus, let my formations not be thus? No, Master Gotama. Pay attention, Satchika, pay attention to how you reply. What you said afterwards does not agree with what you said before nor does what you said before agree with what you said afterwards. What do you think, Satchika, when you say thus, consciousness is myself? Who takes their thoughts personally, tries to make them be the way they want them? Mm. Okay. And over that consciousness, as to say, let my consciousness be thus, let my consciousness not be thus. No, Master Gotama. Pay attention, Satchika, pay attention to how you reply. What you said afterwards does not agree with what you said before nor does what you said before agree with what you said afterwards. What do you think, Satchika? Is material form permanent 
or impermanent. Impermanent, Master Gotama, is what is impermanent, suffering or happiness. Suffering, Master Gotama, is what is impermanent, suffering and subject to change, fit to be regarded thus. This is mine, this I am, this is myself. No, Master Gotama. What do you think, Satrika? Is feeling permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, Master Gotama. Is what is impermanent, suffering or happiness? Suffering, Master Gotama is what is impermanent, suffering, and subject to change, fit to be regarded thus. This is mine, this I am, this is myself. No, Master Gotama. What do you think, Satrika? Is perception permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, Master Gotama is what is impermanent, suffering or happiness. Suffering, Master Gotama, is what is impermanent, suffering and subject to change, fit to be regarded thus. This is mine, this I am, this is myself. No, Master Gotama, what do you think, Satrika? Are formations permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, Master Gotama, is what is impermanent suffering or happiness? Suffering, Master Gotama, is what is impermanent suffering and subject to change fit to be regarded thus? This is mine, this I am, this is myself. No, Master Gotama. Is consciousness permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, Master Gotama, is what is impermanent suffering or happiness? Suffering, Master Gotama, is what is impermanent suffering and subject to change fit to be regarded thus? This is mine, this I am, this is myself. No, Master Gotama. What do you think, Satrika, when one adheres to suffering, resorts to suffering, holds to suffering, and regards what is suffering thus? This is mine, this I am, this is myself. Could one ever fully understand suffering oneself or abide with suffering utterly destroyed? Interesting question. An awful lot of people that are practicing meditation think the opposite. They get into their suffering. They want you to suffer. I know because I experienced that for a long time. <clears throat> so the, the real question here is what do you think, Satchika, when one adheres to suffering? Now we're talking about merit right now. Resorts to suffering, holds to suffering, regards what is suffering thus. If you take it personally, now he's refuting the I am of everything, I am that. This is, I am, this is mine, this is myself. Could one of ever fully understand suffering when you get caught in it? Now that's talking about merit too, but it's not directing it, directly saying merit. Or abide with suffering 
utterly destroyed. So he's, he's talking about demerit and merit. If it's destroyed, it's, it's merit, right? Okay. How could one master Gotama? No master Gotama. What do you think, Satrika, that being so, do you not adhere to suffering, resort to suffering, hold to suffering, and regard what is su suffering as thus? This is mine, this I am, this is myself. How could I not, if he doesn't understand how to let go of craving, as many people that are practicing meditation don't realize, how can they let it go? If they don't recognize what it is, how it arises and how to let it go. Okay. How could I not recognize, uh, be caught in suffering, Master Gotama? Yes, Master Gotama. It is though a man needing heartwood, seeking heartwood, wandering in search of heartwood, were to take a sharp axe and enter the wood, and there he would see a large plankton a large plankton trunk, straight, young, without a, bud, a fruit bud core. Then he would cut it down at the root, cut off the crown, and unroll the leaf sheaths. But as he went on unrolling the, the leaf sheath, he would never even see any a sapwood, let alone heartwood. So too, Satrika, when you are pressed, questioned, and cross-questioned by me about your own assertions, you turn out to be empty, vacant, and mistaken. But it was you who made this statement before the Visali Assembly. I see no recluse or Brahmin, head of an order, head of a group, the teacher of a group, even one claiming to be accomplished and fully awakened, who would not shake, shiver, and tremble, sweat under the armpits if he were to engage in debate with me, even if I were to engage a senseless post in debate it would shake, shiver, and tremble. If it were to engage in debate with me, so what shall I say of a human being? Now, there were drops of sweat on your forehead, and they have soaked through your upper robe and fallen to the ground. But there's no sweat on my body now. The Blessed One uncovered his golden-colored body before the assembly. When this was said, Satchika, the Nigantha son, sat silent, dismayed, with shoulders drooping and head down, glum without response. That'll teach him. <laughs> then Dumuka, the son of the Lekavis, seeing Satrika, the Nigantha's son, in such a condition, said to the Blessed One, a, a, a simile occurs to me, Master Gotama. Explain how it occurs to you, Dumaka. Suppose, venerable sir, not far from a village or town, there was a pond with a crab in it. And then a party of boys or girls went from the town or village to the pond, went into the water and pulled the crab out of the water. And they put it on dry land. 
and whenever the crab extended a leg, they would cut it off and broke it and smashed it with sticks and stones so that the crab with all his legs cut off, broken and smashed would be unable to get back to the pond as before. So too, all Sachika, the Nigantha sun's contortions, writhings and vacillations have been cut off, broken and smashed by the Blessed One. And now he cannot get near the Blessed One again for the purpose of debate. When this was said, Sachika, the Nigantha son, told him, Wait, Dumukha, wait. You are not speak we are not speaking with you. Here we are speaking with Master Gotama. Then he said, Let be, Master Gotama, that talk of ours of other ordinary recluses and Brahmins. It was mere prattle. But in what way is a disciple of Master Gotama one who carries out his instructions, who responds to his advice, who has crossed beyond doubt, become free from perplexity, gained intrepidity and become independent of others in the teacher's dispensation. Here, Satchika, any kind of material form, whatever, whether past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, a disciple of mine sees all material form as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. Any sort, any kind of feeling whatever, whether past, future or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near. A disciple sees, a disciple of mine sees all feeling as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. Here, Satchika, any kind of perception, whatever, whether past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, a disciple of mine sees all perception as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. Here, Satchika, any kind of formation, whatever, whether past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, a disciple of mine, sees all formations as they actually are. With proper wisdom thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. Here, Satchika, any kind of consciousness, whatever, whether past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near. A disciple of mine sees all consciousness as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. 
It is in this way that a disciple of mine is one who carries out my instruction, who responds to my advice, who has crossed beyond doubt, free from perplexity, gained intrepidity, and become independent of others in the teacher's dispensation. Being independent of others is actually saying they are their own teacher. Master Gotama, in what way is a monk an arahat with taints destroyed, one who has lived the holy life, done what had to be done, laid down the burden, reached his own goal, destroyed the fetters of being and is completely liberated through final knowledge. Here, Satchika, any kind of material form, whatever, whether past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, a monk has seen all material form as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. And through not craving and clinging, he is liberated. Any kind of feeling whatever, whether past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near. A monk has seen all feeling, as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself and through not craving and clinging, he is liberated. Any kind of perception, whatever, whether past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, a monk has seen all perception as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. And through not craving and clinging, he is liberated. Here, Satchika, any kind of formation whatever, whether past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near. A monk has seen all formations as they actually are with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself and through not craving and clinging, he is liberated. Any kind of consciousness, whatever, whether past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, a monk has seen all consciousness as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. And through not craving and clinging, he is liberated. It is in this way that a monk is an arahat with taints destroyed one who has lived the holy life, done what had to be done, laid down the burden, reached his own goal, destroyed the fetters of being, and is completely liberated through final knowledge. That's the kind of statement that happens automatically in your mind when you become an arahat. 
When a monk's mind is thus liberated, he possesses three unsurpassable qualities, unsurpassable vision, unsurpassable practice, and unsurpassable deliverance. When a monk is thus liberated, he still honors, respects, reveres, and venerates the Tathagata thus. The Blessed One is awakened, and he teaches the Dhamma for the sake of awakening. The Blessed One is tamed, and he teaches the Dhamma for taming oneself. The Blessed One is at peace, and he teaches the Dhamma for the sake of peace. The Blessed One had crossed over. He teaches the Dhamma for crossing over. The Blessed One has attained Nibbana, and he teaches the Dhamma for attaining Nibbana. When this was said, the Nigantha Satchika, the Nigantha Sun replied, Master Gotama, we were bold and impudent in thinking that we could attack Master Gotama in debate. A man might, ad might attack a mad elephant and find safety, yet he could not attack Master Gotama and find safety. A man might attack a blazing mass of fire and find safety, yet he could not attack Master Gotama and find safety. A man might attack a terrible poisonous snake and find safety, yet he could not attack Master Gotama and find safety. We were bold and impudent in thinking we could attack Master Gotama in debate. Let the Blessed One, together with the Sangha of monks, consent to accept tomorrow's meal from me. The Blessed One consented in silence. Then knowing that the Blessed One had consented, Satchika, the Nigantha son, addressed the Lekavis. Hear me, Lekavis, the recluse Gotama, together with the Sangha of good monks, has been invited by me for tomorrow's meal. You may bring to me whatever you think would be suitable for him. He's asking him to donate the food. <laughs> then when it was night and it had ended, the Lekavis brought 500 ceremonial dishes of milk rice as a gift of food. Now, I've told this story quite a few times. Uh, there's uh, two different kinds of milk rice. One is just cooking the rice in milk, okay? And they, they throw sugar in it and things like that. But I had something offered to me that was really, really special. When they make rice uh, from milk, what they do is they plant the, the best rice they can find and they only uh, take milk for the rice nour nourishment. In other words, it's just a field of milk with rice popping up. And then they take all of that grain and they replant it with milk in the field. And then they take that grain and they replant it again with milk in the field. And I was offered a bowl of that, and it was unbelievable. It was really something special. I, I have no idea why they offered it to me, but they, I was with some other monks that were very famous in Burma. And I just happened to be with them at the right time. So. Laying down the burden, is that the same as giving up personalization? Uh, 
of course, laying down the burden of being reborn again. Get off the wheel. There's, a, there's an interesting thing about this. Uh, a lot of people are very confused about Nibbana and what happens when you get off the wheel and be, you become an arahat and get off the wheel. In the Anguttara Nikaya, there's a short verse that says, suppose you were at the beach and you built a sandcastle and a wave came and knocked it all down. You could never put that sandcastle to, together again in exactly the same way. Now what they're finding out about space is that there is some consciousness in space. And there are some beings that come from that consciousness that start to grow. They're very small, they don't need to have air, but it is live beings. So space is not empty. And to my way of thinking, the only thing that's holding us together is craving and ignorance. Okay, when you become an arahat, and you die, all of these different aggregates are still there because nothing can come from nothing. But these aggregates are still there, but you can never be put together in the same way again. And it seems, it seems at least reasonable that this can be like that. It's a, a conglomeration of things that, well, but when you become an arahat, you don't have any more craving. If there's no more craving, there's no more rebirth. So when you die, you still have your five aggregates as an arahat, but you don't have any craving or clinging. So basically, an arahat is somebody that's coming from their intuition, with their connection to the universe, as it were. And that's the advantage of being around an arahat. They're gonna give you the straight, the straight skinny. They're gonna give you the straight answers. And they turn out to be magnificent teachers if they feel like doing that. Some, some just go off and they don't see people again and, and then they die whenever they die. But a lot of the arahats, they spend their time helping other people to attain Nibbana. With the respect to rebirth, so it's more about the craving it, it is about the craving and clinging. Yeah, but rather than the, the karmic part if, if you don't have any craving, you're not making any bad merit. Okay, there's only good merit that you're making until you die. And uh, absolutely. I looked for 12 years to see if I could find one, and I never did. I went to a lot of claims of arahatship. There's one monk that he uses the name arahat in, in uh, Sri Lanka. And one of my students went and spent some time with him. And what his teaching was, was to be happy. And he, he was uh, always stressing, smiling, laughing. 
and helping other people. But he got heavily criticized for claiming to be an Arahat because he wasn't. Yeah. Well, that's kind of a tricky question. There are people that can become arahats or Pacheka Buddhas when there is not a Sama Sam Buddha around. They can't be in the Buddha era. And Pacheka Buddhas, they uh, stress to people when they see them. They, they, pretty much hide out. But they have to go out for alms round. And whenever they see uh, someone that's, that's giving them some alms food, uh, they can ask questions and they're only going to talk about the importance of keeping your precepts and practicing your generosity and things like that. Uh, so Yes, there are people that can become arahats not in the Buddha era. There are a lot more that become arahats in the Buddha era, but the Buddha said this era was going to last about 5,000 years. And I, I have a book that's a commentary, and it, it seems to be reasonable. Uh, after the Buddha died, there was a lot of arahats around. And I say a lot, but that doesn't mean uh, just every, everybody was an arahat. Uh, there might have been, well, let's say there was 60, 60 million people in India at the time. There might have been 100,000 arahats. They're not that common. Uh, that's still amazing. Do you think that's because there was a lot more teaching of Buddhism? Of course. And the teaching was a lot more pure. But as time goes on and the, the Buddhism goes into other countries, then it starts to get watered down. Now what this commentary said was the first 2,000 years, there were arahats after the Buddha died, but there was the second thousand, there were quite a few less. And after 2,000 years, the highest that people can get to is um, anagami. And we're about halfway through that period. And uh, after after 3,000 years, the highest there can be is a Sakadagami. And then after 4,000, it's Sotapanna. And then the Dhamma just starts disappearing really, really fast. Until right about 5,000 years, Monks don't even know one rule that the Buddha gave. But at 5,000 years, what happens is all the relics of the Buddha get together. And when they come together, there's supposed to be this really major uh, rainbow that lasts for seven days. And that's the mark of the end of the Buddha era. Okay, so the Buddha's teaching is not going to be around at all. So how lucky are we to be born in the Buddha era where the teaching is in reasonably good shape? Yeah. Well, yeah. It's in a little book. I, I know the, the man that wrote it. Uh, oh, 
oh boy. Don't get old. I can't think of his name right now. But he he was uh Kekri Damananda's like really, really close friend and helper. And he was with Kesri Damananda for fifty years. But he was a layman and had his own family and that sort of thing. Well, I have it on my desk. I don't know how to answer that. I suspect not. Not in this universe, anyway. It might be in other universes. Because the universe, it, it, it has an, a definite length of time that it's around, and then it, it disappears. So the, the beings that were in that realm, and in the heavenly realm, above the fourth jhana, they would transmigrate to another universe. But they do, they do have a tendency when they transmigrate to forget the Buddha's teaching. And then that's, it's going to be a long time before another Buddha comes around. The Buddha, uh, the Bodhisattva is right now in the Tusita heaven. A Tusita heaven in, in earth years. One day in Tusita heaven is the equivalent of 400 years on earth. So he's going to, he could be around for a million years before conditions are right for him to take over and become the next Buddha. Yeah. And you mentioned something about um, beings in space being, getting into... They, there are the aggregates that are in space. Oh. They come together in one form or another. And you said that there was actual... Um, yeah, they're, they're proving it right now. They're, they're proving... Oh, jeez. Russian. Uh, <laughs> well, it might actually be Russians because the way they they treat science, they don't try to disclaim anything even when it's really dumb. They get together and see how they can make things work and see whether it's feasible or not. And they're, they're really a long way ahead of our science. Yeah. There's a group at uh, UC Irvine who are studying consciousness and what it means mathematically. Um, so I think it's Donald Collins. He's put forward a theory about how consciousness arrives at the quantum level. Yeah, it has to do with quantum physics. I'm wondering, I don't think there's many people in the world that are teaching the way that you are. You're right. Do you have any hopes or expectations for us um, in terms of carrying on the teaching and spreading? Of course. <laughs> well, the way that I'm I'm setting it up right now, there's there's a group in Indonesia, and it's a group of about thirty five or forty people. The last the last time I was there. To join this group, you have to be at least a Sotapanna. And you have to study 
the suttas and practice before you talk to anybody else. And they have, what do they call it? Uh, the group of people, the uh, mentors. mentors, yeah. And they get together once a month, once every two months, and do a weekend retreat, and they discuss what, how they understand the suttas. Now, it is a little bit disappointing to me that people aren't picking up the way that I teach. They, they like to freelance more. And I'm trying to get them to out loud read the suttas, but it's very difficult. Even the students I have here, they might read just a small part of a sutta and then go on and start talking about it. But it's not as accurate as reading the whole sutta. That's why I do it. Yeah. Are you aware of this at all? Oh, yes. And how could they get to where they are if they aren't? Uh, okay, there's... No, it's six. And there are probably... Fifteen anagamis there. There might be more. Um, there are probably somewhere around 45 saktagamis and the rest are sotapanna. So they have a fairly big group. But the ones that go, go regularly, there's people that they don't want to teach and that's fine, they don't have to. But I, I really want them to be educated. And that's one of the things that I'm, I am very enthusiastic about setting up in India is a monk's school, not a university where you have, I'm working for my PhD, I don't care about a PhD. I've been offered a PhD and uh, yeah, I can go do it, but I don't really, why? When I was introduced to the World Buddhist Council, they, gave, they came with this big book and they said, sign it and put down all of your titles. So I signed it and I put Buddhist monk. <laughs> And they closed the book and they went away and they came running back with the book and they said, we need more titles than that. <laughs> so I put down that I was the abbot of Dhammasukha Meditation Center. And I came up with some other titles that I have been given a lot of titles, but I really don't put much stock in it. I don't care about having a PhD in behind my name. I don't care about letters behind my name. And I have given, I've been given other titles that I'm supposed to be using with my name. And I, I don't wanna. Well, we'll see. They really don't understand Buddhism as a, 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 in India at all. It, it's really easy to contribute in a small way. Um, I'm at UCLA at least once a week. And I always carry David's book and your books in my backpack. And conversation always comes up where they want to know who my teacher is. Huh? Like, oh, I happen to have this here. Would you like to? And so I pass your books out all the time to everybody. Good. And I tell them, um, if if you you know connect to this, you can keep it. It's not just return of initiation. Yeah. I haven't had one return. So you, there's little things that you can do all the time. Oh yeah. And you be the example. You show people what it's like to have an uplifted mind, 
to have a happy mind, to have equanimity. So they see you in action. When there's a stressful situation, you're not gonna go crazy. Like standing right beside a, a burning house, you're not gonna be yelling, fire, 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 you're gonna do something about it. Okay, that's how you teach other people. They will come to you. You know, there's, there's always this idea that there's not enough teachers in the world. And that's just not true. A teacher comes to you when you're ready. I have a lot of people that they just come and start asking me questions. I, I meet them on the airplanes. I meet them in, in, in a lot of different places. And some of them even come back and want to do a retreat. But I'm not into proselytizing. I'm not trying to get huge amounts of people. I'm more interested in quality than I am quantity. And it's growing on its own. It's growing faster than I can believe in some ways. So, right now, in this part of the Buddha era, which is the middle of it, which is incredibly lucky to be born in this period, this is the very start of an upturn for Buddhism. It goes up for a while, then goes down, then comes up and goes down. This is going to be the last going up. How long will it stay up for before it five hundred years. I don't know whether that's good or not. See, there's an awful lot of people that claim to be Buddhist but they don't follow what the Buddha is saying or teaching. And now there's the big push for secular Buddhism. We don't want to use the word Buddha. And that's actually becoming popular. And I find it sad because they're just teachers that are freelancing you listen to some of these teachers at these other big centers on the East Coast or West Coast, you listen to their Dhamma talks and it's like, well, maybe I can pull out one or two things about the Dhamma that are good. And I've listened to this one, one teacher that she makes a statement and then she always says, do you think, possibly, maybe? And she uses that statement more than she does Dhamma. And it's really, it's sad. But that's how it goes. I can't go there and, and correct them. They won't accept me because I'm not with the big number of people. I get criticized a lot because I'm, I'm teaching from the book and I'm reading the book. I get criticized for that. Yeah. And that's okay. I, I, do I care whether they think I'm wrong or right? No. Why don't they uh, have you speaking at these places? Because they have another way of doing it that I don't do and I won't do. And they can sell their books. <laughs> <laughs> are, are you the only person who is teaching In, in, the, in, in the way that I'm showing you right now. Right, because I never heard, so I've had it that way before. Right. There's, there's not many of us around. There's, there's a few. Where, if I may ask, where did you, how did you come?
come up with that because usually they just teach it as you know, repeating the phrases. And, and oh, I did on. that for a number of years, and I saw that it didn't work. And actually, I started going to different commentaries to see what they had to say about it. The different, either monks or... And they would talk about the, the feeling, but in such a general way, that when I, when I finally decided to start teaching, I broke away from the old traditional uh, Dhamma talks and started talking about the importance of feeling, but I didn't have the six R's at that time. So I ran across a book by Stephen Levine. It's called Who Dies? And I highly recommend that book. There's a lot of great stuff in there. And one of the things he started talking about was the feeling. And he wrote what somebody that was dying, uh, his notes before he died. And he came up with this idea of drops. Don't resist or push. Soften. So I started using that, and I started realizing that it's talking about feeling. Soften your mind. And I did that for a few years. And then I was invited to the largest uh, Theravada temple in uh, Kuala Lumpur. That was with K. Sri Dhammananda who was an exceptional man. He wrote 70 or 80 books, and everything he wrote would just be great stuff. He was, he was really wonderful, but he didn't know about meditation. And I found out later that's the reason that he asked me to come and be with him. But he said, you know, I'm getting old now. I give a Dhamma talk every Friday night and there's 300 to 500 people that show up. I want you to give a Dhamma talk every other Friday. So, okay. And of course, I'm gonna talk about meditation. And When I was giving a talk, he was in his room, but he had, a, he had a speaker that was going from the hall, so he listened to my Dhamma talks. <laughs> and then he started actually practicing a little bit, and I, I caught him a few times standing outside the door as I was giving a class. And then I, I saw him starting to sit a little bit and he would ask me questions about the meditation and what I thought he should be doing and that sort of thing. And he actually did pretty well. Uh, he, was, he, was a, he was one of the most fun monks I've ever been around. Because we'd get together, I'd go eat, eat breakfast, you know, have coffee and a, a donut or whatever it was. And then I would go to uh, his room and we would start talking and then we would start laughing and we started having, I mean, it, it was just a great way to start the day. You get up and you start laughing for about a half hour. We were like little kids grinning and He'd, he'd show me a picture of something and, and it'd make me laugh and I would try to show him these kind of things. It was good fun. I did it for two years. But one of his friends from Sri Lanka came to visit him. He was a monk. He'd been a monk for 35 years or something like that. And... Uh, K. Sri Dhammananda told him that I was teaching meditation. 
And he was real interested in any form of Dhamma. He's quite a good scholar. So he came into the, into the kitchen where I was drinking a cup of coffee and he says, I understand you're teaching meditation. How do you teach it? So I started talking to him about drops and how I was teaching it. And he stopped me about halfway through the instructions that I was talking with him about and he said, you're teaching the meditation exactly right, but you're using the language of the commentary, the language of the Visuddhimagga. So he suggested that I put that down. Now that was my main book for 20 years. I knew the Visuddhimagga. I studied it in all kinds of ways and I was trying to match my practice with what they were talking about. And to put it down was like, that was a revolutionary idea because any question I had on Dhamma, sometimes I would try to go to the suttas, but I didn't understand what they were talking about. So I always put the suttas down, went back to the Visuddhimagga because I understood it. And to be told to, why don't you put that down and pick up the suttas and start using the suttas and using the sutta language that was really revolutionary. And when I started doing that, because I didn't have the Visuddhimagga to go back to, I started understanding what they were saying in the suttas and I was having light bulbs popping off in my head. Oh, that's what that means. And then I, uh, I was giving retreats about every other week and uh, they were seven days retreats. Sometimes they were just four day retreats for the weekends. And I started reading the suttas to the students and all of a sudden their progress was just starting to zoom. And it was like, holy cow, I can't keep up with these folks. They, I've already gone through the practice. I was considered a very advanced meditator by the Mahasi Center. But when I dropped that method and just started going to the suttas and seeing how fast the progress was for the students, it was a complete shock because it took me about five years to figure out what the method wasn't before I figured out what it was. And I had students that in three days are getting into the first jhana. And I'm going, there, there's something real special here. I got, I've got to do this more. And I started studying the, this, the Satipatthana Sutta and the Anapanasati Sutta. And their instructions in the meditation is exactly the same. Word for word, letter for letter, it is the same. And I'm noticing, well, I was never told about tranquilize the bodily formation. And it says, this is the way I'm supposed to be practicing. He trains thus. On the in-breath, you tranquilize a bodily formation. On the out-breath, you tranquilize a bodily formation. I was never told anything about that. But I had trouble trying to figure out what the bodily formation was. So I was trying all kinds of put my attention here, put it there, and see what that, that did. And what does it mean to tranquilize? That means there's some tightness and tension somewhere, but I wasn't finding it. One day after giving a talk, I was walking back to my room 
And the whole time I was practicing for 20 years, I always had a headache. There was always tension and tightness in my head. And I'm contemplating, what does it mean to tranquilize a bodily formation? So I thought, I wonder if it's in the head. You know, there's this tightness and I've been told, yeah, that'll go away eventually. Don't pay attention to it. So as I'm walking along, I, I went, what happens if I relax that tightness in my head? So I did. And I was shocked. I didn't have any disturbing thoughts. My mind was clear. It was bright. It was very alert. And I hadn't even gone to the object of meditation yet. And I was like, oh, mm, that, this is good. So I did it again. Every time, my mind had no disturbing thoughts in it. And it felt light. It was really alert. So I went to my room and I sat down and started doing that meditation the way it says in the suttas. The instructions in the Anapanasati Sutta. And I wound up sitting for about two hours. And I was tranquilizing on the in-breath, tranquilizing on the out-breath. And I went deeper in the meditation than I did in 20 years of Mahasi style. And I'm not complaining because I did it, because I did have good concentration and that's the thing that helped me to recognize this other stuff. So it wasn't a waste of time, but it was sure painful. Anyway, um, I started sitting every day for a period of time and then I decided I got to go where I, I'm not disturbed because people were coming to my room and they wanted to talk about this or that and, and they liked the Dhamma talks that I was giving and there was questions about that which I was reading the suttas. So I went to the Keshri Dhammananda and I said, Bhante, I'm going to go to Thailand. I know where there is a cave that's really suitable. If no other monk is there, that's where I'm going to go. And I gave him directions how to get there. It was up by Chiang Rai, which is right on the border of uh, Vietnam and, and th uh, Thailand. And I went there, and nobody was there, but there was a bed. It was a wood bed. Great. There was running water. It was completely suitable. It was, it was as a little bit higher than the ceiling here. And it went over so I can be, have a lot of light. And I could be inside when it started raining. I just get close to the wall, and there you are. Perfect. Was that the one where you had a very interesting compound? I'm just getting to that. <laughs> <laughs> there was a cobra that was living there at the time. And I'm not afraid of snakes. I don't, I don't handle them, I don't do much with them, but I respect them and I, I let them be no problem. So uh, there was a, a village that was about maybe a mile and a quarter away and I had to go up this hill to get to the cave and it was a path that was maybe as wide as this table. And it was nice, there was no problem, but sometimes the snake would be going down as, as I was coming up. And we just kind of passed each other knowing that I wasn't going to hurt him. And then I started talking to him and, and telling him how much I appreciated him. Because you go to places like that, there's always rats and mice. 
and they go after robes. And it's really kind of annoying. But because the snake was there, they didn't come around. So I really much appreciated the snake. And sometimes I would not be paying attention to where he was and I would get a little bit too close and he would go <laughs> and I'd, oh, sorry, back away. Sometimes people would give me the kind of food that snakes could eat and I would share it with him. And so we got to be close friends. But I would get up in the morning and in Thailand, the time that you go out for alms round, you get up and it's dark. And then when you can see the lines in your hand, then you can start going out on alms round. That means the, the people preparing the food, they're ready for you, basically. So I had a nice place that I could get food. I had running water. And it, it was great setup. So I would go out on alms round. I'd come back. Um, generally, it was right around 6 o'clock, between 5.30 and 6, that I would go out for alms round. And I would get so much food, it was unbelievable, because they really liked the idea of having a Western monk there, even though they couldn't talk to me. So I would come back around 7 or 7.30 and I would take a bath and then I would eat and then I started reading the book. And I would read until oh, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, something like that. And then I started sitting. And I sat from then, sat and walked. And there was plenty, the, the, the cave was about as wide as this room, so I, it was really gorgeous. And there was a view of the mountains, and I mean, I mean, it was really, it was very idyllic. But I would uh, sit and walk until 11 or 12 o'clock, and then I'd get up and do it again. But I was having so many oh wows, and every morning I would pick a different suit. I would just flip it open and go, okay, we're going to go to this one and see what it says. And I had so many similar descriptions of what I was going through with the practice that it was remarkable. And I kept on having these oh wow moments and it got to be uh, after about two weeks, I knew I was supposed to go back, but I couldn't. I just stayed and I uh, wound up staying there about three months. And K. Sri Dhammananda sent some, one of his monks in, in Kuala Lumpur all the way up to just about the, the border of Thailand to come get me. And if they, he hadn't have done that, I probably would still be there. I was, I, I mean, it was really something special. But when I came back, all of a sudden, I'm able to, to teach people things in a way that they understood them. The way my mind works is I have a deep, I, I think deeply, but I don't have a quick mind. So sometimes you ask me a question, I don't know the answer, I have to wait till the answer comes. And I, I was told that by a lot of monks, that I would get around them and they'd start looking and they, they monks have ways of communicating that are not speaking, okay? And there is mind-to-mind -mind communication. And I've been told by many monks that I really have a deep mind. And what happens in my mind is I'll run across something in the sutta 
and then I'll start comparing it with my practice, and then I'll start looking at, well, I had uh, one thing that I ran across in the, I think it was the Samyut Nikai, I'm not sure. I, it was. That it talked about the five aggregates and the four foundations of mindfulness. And I started seeing that they were actually the same thing. And I started thinking about every instance, whether that was true or not. And after two or three days of deep thinking about it, I just accepted that as the truth because it really seemed right. And I get back into teaching in Malaysia and I start mentioning about the five aggregates and four foundations of mindfulness being the same way, the, the same thing, and it's sacrilege. You know, you don't know what you're talking about. That's not right. But it is. Um, when I came back, I was so enthusiastic that I decided I was going to write a book and I called it the Anapanasati Sutta. And it was an unusual book because I was using the sutta and I, I was explaining the different parts of the sutta as it went along. And while I was writing it, it took me about 10 months, um, probably 10 hours a day. But people knew I was writing a book, so they kind of left me alone. And then when I would see them, in the evening I got some exercise. I went walking, and it was, I was walking in the temple itself. And they'd come up and they'd say, well, how's your book going? And I'd say, you know, this is really good stuff. As I, I'm going back, rereading and rereading and re and diddling here and there and changing this word and that. And by the time I got done with it, I was I was enthusiastic to read the book, <laughs> and it was like it didn't come from me. And it was really kind of amazing. So I gave it to some of my Chinese friends that were kind of editors, but they were, uh, that was their second language. They didn't really understand English much. So their, the English grammar in that book is, is really suspect. It's really not, not as good as it could be. But that's okay. I was only going to be giving it out in, in Malaysia. So I went and somebody donated the printing of 3,000 books. So I started giving it out and K. Sri Damananda grabbed onto one of those books and he really liked it. And he said, why don't you send this to Taiwan? send them two copies and ask them if they want to print up some copies for me. So I thought, yeah, okay, that sounds like a good thing. And one of my friends had just, uh, a, a few weeks later, had just come back from Taiwan and he said, I saw a book called the Anapanasati Sutta and it looked like your name was on it. Was that you? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, they printed up a few hundred copies to see if people liked it. And now they printed up 40,000 copies and they started sending it all over the world. So it's really kind of a treat that I can go to a monastery and not know anybody there and find my book in their library. <laughs> well, it's really cute. And it, uh, of course I was, I was uh, wanting it to be a free book. And all of a sudden, uh, there was a Laotian temple in, uh, 
I think it was Connecticut or Massachusetts, I don't remember. And um, I, I went there and just to see what the, the temple was like and I see that he has my book on his desk and I said, oh, you know, I wrote that. Mm -hmm. And he said, really? I use that as a uh, teaching guide to all the monks. So I thought, well, that's something. Did you print up some copies of it? Oh yeah, we pre -print, printed up a thousand copies and we give them out. I thought, yeah, okay, that's, that sounds like a good thing. And I come back to America and I went to um, Bhavana Society in West Virginia. That's where um, Gunaratana has his center and I wanted to spend some time with him because I've known him since the 80s. And a student there came and said, you know, this is really a good book. Can I show it to my teacher in New York? And I said, sure, why not? And he liked it so much that he printed up 6,000 copies and started sending it all over New York and all kinds of places. And then uh, Kema decided that she wanted to see how the book was doing and, and just see what was happening with the book. And there were thousands of copies that were printed up that I didn't know anything about. And she had a friend in New York, or in uh, Florida, in Miami, and there was a center there and they printed up, I think it was 3,000 copies. And they were giving it out and they gave out to one of his friends, and or one, one of her friends and he started reading over the phone, he started reading the book and she said, well, that's my teacher. And he said, you mean he's alive? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we thought he was dead. So we just copied it without asking for permission. And that kept happening. And in India, I had a friend that he went into Nepal, I think it was, Mark Johnson? Yeah, was it Nepal or was it India? I don't remember. Anyway, he went to this little tiny monastery and he found my book in it. And he got so enthusiastic, he started practicing with me. But there were people that, that from all over the world that are, they, there's copies around and we found out that there was about 750,000 copies printed worldwide. I didn't have anything to do with that. <laughs> it was amazing. And it was kind of fun. Really? Oh, okay. You can get it on Amazon. I was showing up copies to sell um, out to anybody, and then I was undercut by everybody else, so I gave up. You know, it's like thousands of dollars more than Amazon. Yeah. Well, yeah. So when they. After you came back from the cave, is that when you started teaching with six hours and learning time? Not six hours. I was teaching still with uh, drops, but I was teaching about the relaxed step. When we came back, when I came back to America, uh, Mark and Antra set up a retreat in the mountains in San Diego. And there was a man that came and he was doing the retreat and he was listening to my Dhamma talks. And one day 
he comes with a little post-it and he said, this is what you're teaching. And it had release, relax, re-smile, return. Release, relax, re-smile, return. Anyway, there was five R's. Uh, no, he didn't do the recognize. I added that uh, sometime later. And then I just put it aside. I didn't think about it anymore. And I moved to Missouri, and one of my students found it, because I'd, I'd put it in a book, and I gave her the book to read. And she found it, and she said, wow, this is really something. This is the way it works. And away we went with the six R's. And we have lots of copies that are printed and reprinted and reprinted. And now all the copies and a lot of a lot of the books are retranslated into I think there's twelve, fourteen languages. Some of them are bizarre languages. Like it got it got recopied into Korean. I know I never would have suspected that. And it got recopied into Norwegian because the guy that did the the re online retreat was so enthusiastic. He translated it so his mother could do it. <laughs> That's a wonderful thing. When did you change over to the loving kindness meditation? I I did that right after I got out of Burma. Uh, so that would be 1992 in November, December, that area. The reason that I did it was I went back to Kuala Lumpur. I, I'd set up a meditation, uh, uh, I set up a monastery. And when I started, there was about 15 families. And when I went to Burma, there was about 600. And then I, I came back from Burma and they wanted me to teach meditation, but I couldn't with a clear conscious, uh, a clear mind, teach Vipassana because I knew it didn't work. So there was this group that was called the uh, BGF, the Buddhist Graduation, Graduating Fellowship. And there's all these, these people that were, that had gone to college and now they were in their working life and they wanted me to, um, they, they heard that I was starting to teach loving kindness in a, a very few people. And they were kind of tired of the straight Vipassana so that, oh, he teaches something different. Let's see what he does. So they came and asked if I would give a weekend retreat. And it was a weekend retreat for 60 people. And I had them do a big circle. And I've done this for some years and put one person in the middle and then everybody radiate loving kindness to them. And it's really powerful. I mean, you feel that, that this is real. This is something that's really good. So we did that and that became very popular. And uh, they kept it going and um, I came back to America for uh, six weeks or eight weeks, something like that. And then when I came back, there was huge groups of people that, that are saying, we want you to give a retreat. And I said, the only retreat I'm gonna give is loving kindness. That's what we want. 
the, the thing with straight vipassana is it has a tendency to make your mind hard. And it has a tendency to uh, make you very critical. And you have a tendency to be critical and judge people and you wind up not being so happy. So they, they heard about loving kindness and the first retreat I gave it was for, well the first retreat after the, the <coughs> big one, it was about 40 people. And I started giving interviews every day with the, the loving kindness. And it got real popular. So I, I was giving retreats about every other week for three or four months. And every time there was between 30 and 40 people. And I was giving Dhamma talks, but I wasn't really reading it yet. That was in must have been 93, maybe 94, I, I just don't remember. And then I was, I was invited to, to go to K. Sri Dhammananda's place in 95, and that's where I wrote the book. And then there was, once a week, there was 50 or 60 people that were coming for a, a class every week. And right after I had this talk with Venerable Punaji, this monk that told me to let go of the Visuddhimagga, my language started changing and I started using more Dhamma language for the Dhamma talks and then that's when I started reading the suttas. And I was seeing people in one or two days getting into a jhana. And, and I, I thought they were lying to me. Nobody can do it that fast. You know, I did an eight month retreat when I came back from Burma. And I did an eight month loving kindness retreat. And I didn't have that kind of progress because I was doing the Visuddhimagga way. I didn't know to give that up yet. So when, when people are starting to listen to the suttas and they're starting to progress so fast, how can that be possible? They start talking a lot about joy coming up and their mind got real peaceful and calm and and I'm, I'm going through the books going, that's what it says here, but <laughs> how can that be? You know, that's better than my practice was. But it caught on. And, and it, it, it caught on because of this, uh, this group, BGF, the Buddhist Graduate Fellowship. And they started teaching on their own and they had their own newsletter and they're talking about all the wonderful things when you practice metta, that how happy people get, how they get healed and all kinds of things. So when I came back from Burma and I, asked, I was asked to go to K. Sri Dhammananda's place, it was right before the range retreat. The range retreat is where I had to stay for three months without moving. And that's fine. It, it happens every year. No big deal. So we're getting up. We're going on to a, a platform. And the thing with Buddhist monks is you always go by seniority. The oldest monks are first and then the youngest monks are way back here. Now, at that time, I had been a monk about eight or nine years. And so I was getting in line in, in towards the back of the, of, of the, the line, and K. Sri Dhammananda walks by and he said, no, I want you to be up here with me. 
So I'm the second one in line and I'm feeling really uncomfortable. And we're starting the start of the range retreat and there's two or 3,000 people taking part in it and they, they really like that sort of ceremonies and that stuff. So Keshri Dhammananda is talking and he said, we are really, really lucky because we have a famous meditation monk here. And I'm thinking, oh, really? This is great. <laughs> and I start looking down the line and none of those monks are meditation monks. And I'm, I'm thinking, wow, this is really something. And Keshri Dhammananda is handing me the microphone. And he said, uh, why don't you give a talk? An hour and a half will be long enough. Now this is no preparation at all. Being shocked that I'm, I'm called a famous monk. I had no idea I was famous. I still don't know. <laughs> but I got through it and people really appreciated it and then I started teaching more and more and I was teaching every day. I was going to different groups and teaching loving kindness once a week for five or six groups and then I had the group that was at, at the center. So that's kind of my story. So when did you start teaching the way that you're teaching now? I started teaching right after uh, I wrote the book okay. in 95. Well, actually, I, I think I started in 93 with that big group of people, but I wasn't, uh, I wasn't so enthusiastic about it. I had to learn more. And that's when this other monk came through and he taught me these great lessons. And I'm forever beholden to him. And we have a, a picture of him in the, in the meditation hall. Uh, Punaji. Huh? I'm just wondering, um, was there a struggle for you to decide if you want to become a monk? Or was there a sign or anything you just knew that this was your calling? Or was it a, a debate back and forth? Well, uh, back in 1980, I started taking care of Usilananda, who was a very famous monk in Burma highly educated and I got to be friends with him and uh, I was always pestering him about Buddhism and I don't know anything so you got to tell me and you got to show me where I can find stuff out and that kind of thing and while I was with him I ordained for two weeks now, the reason I didn't ordain longer was I was his attendant and there was nobody to offer food because I was the one that was offering food to him. And then I became a monk and I couldn't offer food. I had to have it handed to me. Then, after two years, I decided to do go into business and that sort of thing. And then I got tired of doing that. And I uh, decided to go to Thailand. And when I went to Thailand, I went to a meditation center, a Burmese meditation center, and I decided, well, you know, it's getting close to the anniversary of my father's death. He died two days after Christmas. And it's a good thing to share merit when you do something good with your departed family. So I decided, well, I'm going to become a monk. I'll be a monk for a year. In a year, I should be a sotapanna. I should have three or four jhanas. Because I was serious about meditation. And. I ordained, and as soon as I put the robes on, they grabbed a hold of me. 
and I, the monks had come up. Are you going to stay a monk? I don't know. I don't think so. Oh, you ought to stay a monk. But the longer I was a monk, the more interesting things became because I had access to books that most laymen didn't have, and they were in English. And I wound up staying in Thailand for quite a while. And then I started moving around, and I went to Singapore, and I went to uh, uh, Penang. And a friend of mine, he, he was a monk of, oh, must have been 50, 55 years that I'd met when I was with Usilananda. He had a monastery, a big monastery in, uh, uh, in on Penang, in Penang. And I, uh, he he started asking me we we, we would be invited to a, for a meal to somebody's house and he started asking me and this this was i, I was a very young monk at the time and I, he would ask me to give a dhamma talk and i was kind of shy cuz i i knew a lot of dhamma but i didn't i didn't know how to talk about it and he kept on doing it. And he said, well, you only got to talk for 10 minutes. So I'd try to talk for 10 minutes, and he liked what I was saying. And he started saying, well, why don't you talk for 20 minutes? And then why don't you give a talk at the temple when we have ceremonies? And that got me hooked on giving talks. And it's a real interesting phenomena. It's, uh, I was, it didn't matter how big a group of people I was talking to, I never got nervous. And I started asking this monk about it, and he said, well, yeah, because you keep your, pre your 227 rules. And because you do that, you're never going to be nervous when you get in front of large groups of people. And I've been in, in front of a, a group of 10,000, giving a Dhamma talk, no problem. And they keep on wanting me, why don't you talk longer? Wow. But I, when I was in India, I was giving talks to large groups of people, but I don't really care about that. I don't, I don't want to be uh, super famous. I, I like being not famous, although people are telling me that I am. I don't, I don't understand that. But I'm more interested in smaller groups of people that I can teach. And that's, that's what I want to be doing. I don't want to be having newspapers and putting me on the front page like I'm something special and, and he's going to be here giving a talk. And they, 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 they do that sort of thing. And I'm, I'm really not interested in that. I'm more interested in Dhamma. It's a separate practice. I still teach Anapanasati if somebody absolutely wants to, but if they've been doing it for a while, I back away because they won't follow the directions. They will forget. Mindfulness of breathing, you'll get into your habit like you've done for the last how many years and then I'm going to have to change you over to loving-kindness anyway because you don't know what's going to happen next. 
and your progress in loving kindness is a lot faster to get where most of you are right now with Anapanasati takes about six weeks. And you're doing it in less than 10 days. Yeah. I'm curious why, why do you think the Buddha taught these different meditation techniques? They're not different techniques. They're all six R's. Right, but the different objects. Well, I'm not sure that he did. I haven't run across 40 different objects in the suttas. I have run across a lot of different ones that aren't mentioned, but that's from the Visuddhimagga. He only taught one kind of meditation, but the people that do the Visuddhimagga, they say it's 40 different kinds of meditation. No, that's not right. Uh, then, uh, I, sh I show you loving kindness. Yeah. The thing is, with uh, loving kindness meditation is mentioned more than a hundred times in the suttas. Mindfulness of breathing is mentioned eight times in the suttas. What do you think he taught more? He taught a lot of loving kindness. 